So welcome everyone, welcome to the today's session of Augmented Intelligence Workshop. As you know, in this series of short talks, we are exploring how we extend our minds in different ways through our social networks of other humans and through technical networks of various machines. The workshop is organized by Rob Goldstone, Marina Dubova, and uh, Gautam Biswas and myself. And today we are excited to have two distinguished speakers whose talks will span both aspects of augmented intelligence that we are exploring here. Celia Hayes, our first speaker, is a senior research fellow in theoretical life sciences at All Souls College at the University of Oxford. And she will be talking about how our advanced sociality gave rise to the cultural evolution of our unique cognition, and in particular to different cognitive gadgets, as she calls them. And uh, the second speaker, Jeremy Davidson, who is, will be a little bit late, I think. Uh, he's a professor of communication, education, and symbolic systems at Stanford University, where he founded a virtual human interaction lab. We'll be talking about uh, how people interact with technology and each other in immersive virtual reality settings. And they'll be telling us how human cognition reacts and might further develop or not in the much anticipated or dreaded metaverse. And so taking together this, uh, both of these uh, talks cross the arch from how our sociality propelled our uniquely human co uh, cognition in the first place, and how we are continuously developing new gadgets and tools to improve our cognition further or deteriorate. So we'll see. And before Celia takes us on this journey, uh, followed by Jeremy, let me just note that this meeting is being recorded, will be posted on the workshop YouTube channel. And so please make sure that your microphone is turned off at all times unless you're speaking. Uh, and feel free to post any meeting related thoughts in the uh, chat window, anything that comes to mind, any questions, and we will post the chat later on our Slack channel. You're also welcome to post directly to Slack and uh, post relevant publications and so on. After each talk, we will take a couple of questions specific to the talk. Uh, so just raise your hand or post a question in chat and I will moderate the discussion. And in the last 20 minutes or so, we'll open to a more broader discussion on questions related to both talks and augmented intelligence more generally. So thank you, Celia, uh, for being with us. Please take it away. And then thank just you. Uh, I, so hey, Celia, so, so nice oh, to meet you. you. Um, Hello. I just want to let you know that I am going to be camera off for the first 15 minutes or so. I'm, I still have one of my daughters that's doing um, school pickup. So I'm uh, I'm listening, but I'll be off camera and I'm excited. So thank you. Great. Well, thanks. Well. thanks for letting us know. Um, there we are. Great. Thank you very much, Meta. I've, I've greatly enjoyed attending um, many talks in this series over the last few months. So I'm really glad to be giving one myself. And that has said, um, in the last few years, I've been developing um, a cultural evolutionary psychology. Um, so this is um, a, an account of the development and evolution of a human mind, um, which portrays them as fundamentally social or fundamentally collective. Um, now, my, uh, I'm not a modeler, and although I ran a lab doing experiments with um, humans and non-human animals for 20 years, I gave up my lab some time ago, and now I spend my time um, sifting and pondering evidence from various areas of psychology and cognitive neuroscience. But in this talk, I'm not, you know, it's brief, I'm not going to be presenting much of the data, blink and you miss it. This is an old fashioned ideas talk. I just want in the time available to communicate to you the basic ideas of cultural evolutionary psychology. So like the, um, one second. like classical evolutionary psychology, uh, which you know, got off the ground in the 1980s, led by Steven Pinker and later Cosmides and John Tooby. Um, cultural evolutionary psychology is focused on distinctively human cognitive mechanisms. So that's uh, modes of thought or faculties which are present in the vast majority of adult humans but which are absent 
or present only in some shadowy or trace form in other species. And here's a set of the candidates currently under most active discussion. Of course, language and mathematical cognition um, are regarded as distinctively human cognitive mechanisms, but also there's an array of others, imitation, mind reading or theory of mind, mental time travel, a kind of a generic term for episodic memory and planning capacity, um, mental mapping of space, causal cognition, selective trust or selective social learning, normativity or morality, and explicit metacognition. These are all candidate distinctively human cognitive mechanisms. And the aim of uh, cultural evolutionary psychology, like the aim of classical evolutionary psychology, is to give an account of where these come from, of their origins, and of why they tend to work reasonably well. Um, now, according to classical evolutionary psychology, uh, the answer to those questions is that they evolved by basic genetic mechanisms in the Stone Age um, as adaptations for life in small social groups, hunter-gatherer life. Um, and they do their jobs reasonably well, reasonably well, relative to that time, um, because they were shaped by Darwinian selection operating on genetic variants. In contrast, the cultural evolutionary psychology or cognitive gadgets view says that each of these distinctively human cognitive mechanisms um, develops from old parts through social interaction in the course of childhood. So by old part, I mean um, component cognitive mechanisms uh, that we humans have in common with a broad range of other animals. But the suggestion is that those old parts get configured into new systems through interaction with other people who already have those new systems in the course of childhood. So that's the developmental component of the cognitive gadget theory. The evolutionary component is to say, well, insofar as these mechanisms do their jobs well, it's because they've been shaped not by genetic selection, but by cultural selection. So the idea is that Distinctively human cognitive mechanisms are a bit like simple pieces of material technology. Um, things like traps and uh, spinning wheels and canoes. So take the canoe. Historical evidence suggests that canoes, well, we, we know that canoes don't do their jobs well by virtue of genetic evolution. They are not organically evolved things. But historical evidence suggests that simple canoes weren't designed with foresight either, um, with some kind of understanding of hydrodynamics and so on. Rather, people generated different canoe shapes and materials and so on, um, some of them did their job better than others. Some of them were more likely to stay afloat and move more swiftly through the water than others. The ones that stayed afloat were more likely to be around when people wanted to make more canoes and they would copy the ones that were relatively good at doing their job rather than the others. And by that route of cultural selection, canoe design improved. So that's kind of a core analogy that distinctively human cognitive mechanisms may have evolved in basically that way. Just to spell it out a little more, 
Think about the example of imitation, very close to my heart. I've been studying imitation, unlike the other distinctively human cognitive mechanisms um, throughout most of my career. So where would a new, uh, slightly better way of imitating body movement come from? How would it arise on this view? Well, it might be that a social group defined by geography and language, not defined genetically. Um, the members of a social group have a basic mechanism which enables them to copy body movement. Um, but then there is some change in um, child rearing practices, in ritual practices, in technology within that society, which provokes some individuals within the society to have a slightly modified cognitive mechanism for imitation. So, but these cultural mutations are generated without foresight. So it might be that, for example, a change in religious belief or religious practices means that children are more likely to be encouraged to engage in synchronous activities, say in synchronous dancing with other members of the society. And this increased engagement in synchronous activity actually promotes the development of a new, potentially improved cognitive mechanism for imitation. But nobody in the society knows that, as it were. They had, insofar as they had reasons for the change in their practices, those reasons were religious. Nobody was anticipating that it would make children better able to imitate. So that's where, as it were, the cultural mutations come from. They come from various sources without foresight. Then they are socially rather than genetically inherited. Now, I have a, a whole theory that um, offers an account of how the kinds of social interactions that a child has with older children and with adults in the course of development could construct in them a mechanism which enables imitation learning. I don't have time to go into that, but suffice it to say that this you know, empirically tested and fairly successful theory suggests that the experience of being imitated by others is fundamental to building a capacity for imitation and the range of actions that are imitated and the fidelity with which they are copied will influence the precise characteristics of the mechanism which develops. So children pick up the new variant imitation mechanism through interaction with those who have it. Now, like genetic mutations, most cultural mutations will rapidly disappear. They will be no better than what was there before. They might be a lot worse. But in some cases, they will spread within the society because the bearers have more, let's call them students. So it might be that the new variant mechanism for imitation makes the bearer more technologically or socially successful. That may increase their reproductive fitness. They may have more biological children and those biological children learn socially the new imitation mechanism from them. But the learners, the students, don't have to be their biological children. It might be that having the new imitation mechanism makes a member of a social group more salient or more attractive and therefore biologically unrelated children spend more time in interaction with them and acquire the new variant imitation mechanism. So that's the basic idea of cultural selection. Just to clear away a potential misconception, some people say, is this a blank slate theory of cognitive um, development? No, it most certainly isn't. Um, obviously humans, I'm suggesting, 
are genetically inheriting the old parts, the cognitive components that we have in common with other animals, we're genetically inheriting those. And also, I think there is evidence that in the hominin line, genetic evolution has made some small changes to the mind relative to our common ancestor with chimpanzees. But these are small quantitative inflectional changes rather than the production of whole new ways of thinking. And I think the evidence suggests that genetic evolution has tinkered with our temperaments, making us more socially tolerant and socially motivated. It's given us certain attentional biases, like a face bias and a voice bias, and it's expanded domain general cognitive processes. And all of these things make us more malleable by our social environment in the course of development. And one of the effects of that malleability is to enable us to build new cognitive processes, cognitive gadgets through social interaction. Now, let me just show you not evidence, but um, give you an idea of my empirical approach. I mean, what I have done is gone through a number of the distinctively human cognitive mechanisms uh, shown down here, one by one. And for each one, I will sift the evidence from various areas of psychology and cognitive neuroscience, so it includes developmental, social psychology, um, comparative psychology, experimental psychology. And that sifting is asking whether there is wealth or poverty of the stimulus. So it's looking at variation in the cognitive faculty, say um, mind reading or theory of mind, looking at variation across ages, across childhood development, variation across individuals within a society, um, across groups, that is across cultures, and across species, and asking whether there is enough um, information in the developmental environment to explain these different kinds of variation, or whether there is, as Chomsky called it, poverty of the stimulus, whether this variation cannot be explained by variation in information in the developmental environment. And I take wealth of the stimulus to be supportive of a kind of a cognitive gadget view and poverty of the stimulus to be supportive of the classical evolutionary psychological view, the view that distinctively human cognitive mechanisms are cognitive instincts. I'm also very interested in training data, which looks at just how malleable human cognitive processes are. And the analysis is nearly always contrastive. So I know some scientists think the best way to make a name, and maybe it is the best way to make a name, but I don't think it's epistemologically very healthy, is to just plow your own furrow, as it were, make positive claims and assemble confirmatory evidence. I don't think that's very healthy. And so I tend to work, as it were, on both sides, taking a critical view towards the more nativist classical evolution in psychology and seeking positive evidence relating to cultural um, evolutionary processes. Um, let's take the example of imitation again um, and the training studies work in my own lab um, showed that an automatic tendency to imitate can be abolished um, or induced or reversed by novel sensory motor experience. And in a similar way, the properties of mirror neurons 
can be changed radically by novel sensory motor experience. So this was work which was testing a prediction of the cultural evolutionary view. On the contrastive side, I've also taken a keen interest in putative evidence of imitation in newborn babies, which clearly, if valid, would suggest that the cognitive gadget account of imitation is wrong, that we are capable from birth of imitating. But I'm not going to show you any of those data. Instead, I thought you might enjoy a couple of quick examples from AI. Um, here's a study done a few years ago, which is a kind of a proof of principle that you can build a capacity to imitate um, from learning for which there is no specific genetic preparation to make you capable of imitation. And in this study by Asada, um, there is a robot baby, and the robot baby is randomly generating facial expressions. And then there is a human caretaker who is copying those facial expressions. When the robot baby smiles, the caregiver smiles. When the robot baby frowns, um, the caregiver frowns. Now, the robot baby has a camera um, which detects the caregiver's facial expression, feeds the information to a processor which categorizes these facial expressions, and then there is a direct, simple associative mapping between the facial expression of the caregiver, the category of facial expression to which the caregiver's expression belongs, and the internal state of the robot baby when it produced that facial expression. And after this sort of training, the robot baby can copy facial expressions of emotion. If the caregiver or if somebody else frowns at the robot baby, the robot baby will frown back. If they smile at the robot baby, the robot baby will smile back and the facial expressions of laughter and so on. So a very simple proof of principle the robot baby has no program for the development of imitation. Um, it has basic sensory capacities and capacities for associative learning, but still it ends up being capable of imitation. Now, I had nothing to do with that work. That was pure convergence of my thinking with clearly Asada's thinking. But the other example I'll mention to you, I'm very pleased to say was inspired by my work on cognitive gadgets. This is work which is ongoing by Ed Hughes at DeepMind and his colleagues in the Cultural General Intelligence team. And they read about cognitive gadgets and they liked the idea that with a very lean starter kit of capacities, a deep reinforcement learning system could learn to imitate. And the kind of imitation they were interested in was not facial gesture imitation, but imitating um, trajectories through space, including kind of uh, body orientation within those trajectories. So um, just very briefly, and with their very bright illustration here, they allow a virtual agent with a very lean starter kit, we can get into that if you like, they, as it were, throw this virtual agent into an environment with um, an expert. The expert agent um, knows how to collect a sequence of rewards which are spatially distributed within the environment or the world in a variety of ways. So these um, spatial distributions and sequences are known as games. So it might be relatively simple. It might be that the expert um, you know, uh, first goes to blue, then pink, then turquoise, then orange in a kind of a cycle. Um, or it might be a more complex trajectory between locations. Um, the uh, 
naive virtual agent is mildly programmed to attend just to orient to the expert. Um, over trials with one of these configurations, say this game here, and in one of a number of different worlds, the um, naive agent uh, is allowed to follow and gradually over trials, the expert drops out. At the end of that training, the um, follower is able to collect the rewards in the fixed sequence using the appropriate trajectory all by itself. Okay, more interesting is that when this training is given on um, a few different sequences in one of the worlds, then the virtual agent is able to transfer to a human controlled avatar, which is much more variable, and it can do the imitation learning in the full range of worlds, those which it's encountered, but also new ones. So another kind of proof of principle, but with a very lean starter kit and um, domain general learning, a system can learn to imitate. Now I have one final slide about thoughts on collective intelligence and human evolution, but do I have time to deliver it? Good, okay, fine. Um, the idea that collective intelligence is what makes human mind special has been around for a very long time among those who are interested in human evolution. Perhaps the most prominent view at the moment comes from uh, Michael Mufu Krishna and Joe Henrik. And um, in effect, their work contains three conceptions of collective intelligence, which I think might be more broadly useful. So they say, look, there are what they call cultural brains. This is type one collective intelligence. They say that many animals, many different species of animals um, socially learn. They learn with some kind of a system from other members of their species, much of the information that they need for survival and reproduction. So that's in a sense, a very weak kind of collective intelligence. It's just picking up information from others. Then they say, well, there's, there's a much smaller range of species. They don't specify, but they probably have kind of non-human apes in mind that have what they call cumulative cultural brains. And these creatures, um, not only capable of basic social learning, but they're capable of varieties of social learning which are relatively high fidelity. They typically call that imitation. And they're capable of strategic social learning. That is that they can make, as it were, wise choices about who to learn from. Um, they show conformity biases, prestige biases, and so on. And then finally, there are humans, and humans only, who have what they call collective brains. And they say, you know, in addition to basic social learning, high fidelity social learning, strategic social learning, humans have norm psychology and ethnic psychology. Um, now, my take, uh, this, isn't, this isn't something that they say, is that what really marks off the collective brain from the cumulative cultural brain is that the individuals um, within a collective brain have some representation of the collective that they are in. So Muthu Krishna and, and Henrik don't spell out why norm psychology and ethnic psychology um, make such a difference, as it were, make humans so special. But I think uh, a plausible way of glossing what they say would be you know, when the members have some representation of the whole. Now, I agree with a lot of this about, you know, which species have what kinds of capacities. Um, where the difference arises is on, oh, let's try that. 
the origins of these faculties contributing to the more advanced collective intelligences. So Muthu Krishna and um, Henrik are what's known as um, dual inheritance or gene culture evolutionists. So although it's very important to them that um, facts and specific skills are socially learned, culturally inherited, they think that the cognitive processes that make that cultural inheritance possible, things like imitation, strategic social learning, norm psychology, and so on, that those are genetically inherited. Whereas what I have been suggesting is that even the cognitive processes that make cultural inheritance of facts and skills possible, they are themselves culturally inherited. Now, in a way, that idea is deeply scary. Um, it suggests that within very few generations, a society could, for example, completely change the kinds of models that it finds attractive to copy, or it could completely change its normative psychology, um, arguably to the point where the members of the society have difficulty in conceiving of should or distinguishing right from wrong. So in a way, there's a very scary aspect to this idea that the mechanisms are culturally inherited. But on the other hand, it suggests huge potential for design of human collective brains or collective intelligence. So whereas classical evolutionary psychology would say that, you know, if people who work on um, social networks were to come up with good uh, designs for the structure and dynamics of those networks to make them work um, efficiently, um, there would be deep biological resistance in some cases to the implementation of those good designs. We, we're supposed to have these stone age brains inside modern skulls. On the other hand, I think the cognitive gadget cultural evolution view suggests that our minds were shaped by cultural evolution to be malleable by the environment in which we grew up. So although there might be political and commercial obstacles to implementing good network design, there would not be biological obstacles. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I invite everyone to clap in uh, live or by little uh, icons. And I invite you to ask questions. We have a time for a couple of questions. Maybe to start us off and then uh, to relate it to, to Syria's last point about potential dangers of losing what we learned. Uh, Rob, would you like to ask your question about Bolivian effects? Oh, yeah, sure. So thanks, Celia, for the awesome talk. I really enjoyed it a lot. Um, and I found it very effective, your juxtaposition of the kind of Pinkerian story from your cognitive gadgets account. But I'm also kind of interested in what you think about proposals to kind of blend them more and think about ways in which like um, cultural evolution could be sort of the avant-garde, uh, sort of learning things for the culture that then become entrenched genetically. So that would be sort of like um, more bi-directional uh, interactions between cultural and genetic evolution. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I pretty much, you know, my account is a blended account. There are plenty of ingredients in there which are genetically inherited. It isn't a blank slate theory. But yes, in principle, there could be what people call genetic assimilation. So it could be that the origin story I tell about where new cognitive mechanisms come from is correct, but that um, these cognitive, new cognitive mechanisms are so handy, as it were, so um, advancing of biological fitness, 
that individuals who need less experience to develop them have more biological offspring, and therefore there is pressure for, as it were, the um, the development of a genetic program for them. That's possible. There's also modeling by Morgan and colleagues, which shows that the reverse can happen, which is that an attribute can be so reliably culturally inherited that it removes selection pressure on the genes. It kind of screens the characteristics from biological selection pressure. So both possibilities are there. So it seems to me, you know, an experimental psychologist to the last, you've got to look at the data. And um, my take is that there is not positive evidence for any of the faculties that I've looked at, that there are the kinds of constraints on learning that you would expect there to be if there had been genetic assimilation. But I think that's the way to answer the question, kind of case by case, and to look for that evidence of constraint, which would, which would show up as resistance to training. For example, you know, you you shouldn't be able to turn automatic imitation into automatic counter imitation if the development there is buffered. Thank you. Uh, I have a several questions, so let me uh, choose one. So uh, it, it seems that we humans are uniquely capable of uh, constantly reshuffling our social networks from and change our groupings from diets to various teams to organizations and collectives and our international organizations. And for that capacity, it seems the representation of the collective that you mentioned seems essential. So we need to have some representation. Is there more to it? Have you perhaps thought about it? Is there, is there some specific cognitive gadget that some kind of metacognitive thing that helps us to, to rearrange our social networks during the day, uh, even de de uh, depending on the demands of the particular task? It's not something that I've worked on, but um, I don't know whether you know Ehud Lamb's work in Tel Aviv. Um, and he is working now on exactly this, on what he calls a social identity gadget. He thinks that there is evidence, you know, he, he knows a lot more about social psychology than I do. And he thinks that if you look at the social psychology of group identity, you find evidence of very marked, for example, cross-cultural variation and a very strong impact of the kinds of social interactions that children have with their parents on their conceptualization of social groups and on their inferences about social groups. So I would recommend looking at his work, but also Molly Crockett and Brady. I'm afraid I don't know Brady's first name, um, are doing some brilliant stuff on social media and how the, what's, what's that phrase for audience collapse or something on social media? You have to get used to the fact that, you know, although in everyday life you have a number of different audiences, on something like Twitter, it turns into one audience. And they think that in at least some Twitter users, this is producing a kind of a new way of thinking about group membership. Um, so not my work, but I think there is really interesting work going on in that area. Thank you for the pointers. And I would love to continue this discussion. My apologies, Linda, but I would uh, I think we should move to the next talk and I'll call on you first <laughs> after after we are uh, open for the more general discussion. So uh, our second speaker, I already introduced Jeremy Belson from Stanford University. Please take it away. Thank you. I am, uh, despite doing this many times, the share screen option always takes me a minute. So thank you for your patience here. Anybody know the hot key to start a slideshow? Five, sometimes. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, can everybody hear me okay? So my name is Jeremy Balenson, and I got my PhD in cognitive psychology in 1999. I studied categorization, reasoning, decision-making, and in 99, I made a pretty abrupt switch. Uh, I went to UC Santa Barbara and spent four years um, learning how to build virtual reality, how to do the hardware for it, how to program the content for it. At the same time, I moved away from just traditional cognitive psych questions to broader questions about social interaction and learning and communication and training and, and just studying this medium and all that it affords. And so in 2003, I got a job at Stanford in the Department of Communication, where uh, COM is a bit different than psych, that in COM, uh, we can study media as in, the medium is the theoretical aspect of the work. And so it's kind of, in some ways, freeing for me to not only study the brain, but to also be able to really just focus on what this medium is. And so I've been doing for 20 years, I've been doing research uh, about VR and teaching about VR. Um, uh, there's the URL of our web uh, page with lots of PDFs that you can look through. And there's our Twitter handle where we um, announce new findings. So again, I've been doing this since 1999. And uh, when I first started using VR, the headsets cost about $40,000. There was maybe a thousand of them in existence uh, globally. And, you know, there wasn't all that much to do in there. And so fast forward to today, where you can um, buy a headset for about 300 bucks. It comes out of the box and you're in VR. Uh, a minute later, you don't need a dedicated room, you don't need uh, an engineer, it just comes out like a product. And it's a very exciting time when there's just uh, VR is plentiful. Um, unfortunately, um, great VR content is not plentiful. Uh, and many of you have, may have had the experience when you've tried VR, which is all right, this is kind of a cool experience, but I'm not really sure what I would do. This is Popper, uh, my grandfather, who's 91 uh, in this photo. And a, a big theme of my work is coming up with study and applications where you're actually leveraging the affordances of VR that works well. But what I'm going to talk about today, um, I joke about this as my COVID pet project, Um I have dedicated the last two and a half years of my life to this, which is teaching in VR, in headset, and running experiments during teaching in VR. And so my day job used to be someone would come to my lab, I'd stick the goggles on them, uh, take the goggles off, and we'd measure all sorts of things. They'd come in one at a time, sometimes three at a time. We now um, do it a little bit differently. And I'm going to talk uh, today about just this process that we're going through, all this data we have and, and what we're finding. And I, you know, I, 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 I debated in my head, it's such an opportunity to talk to this group. I debated, do I wanna find the thing that's most relevant to this group or do I wanna talk about the thing that I'm just super excited about? And I chose the latter. And I, I think it's very relevant to this group, but I, um, I, I hope you do enjoy hearing about this class. So we've now taught the class four times, about 500 students total, which uh, is about 10% of the undergraduate population at Stanford. Um, and we have an incredible amount of people um, who have uh, participated uh, an incredible amount of time. Um, so to give you a sense of this, in March 2020, like most of you, you've got to tell the chair of your department uh, when you're going to teach. And I volunteered at the time, Stanford was, they, they thought if they spread teaching out across four quarters, um, that you could reduce wear and tear uh, because fewer people were around at one time uh, from, an epi uh, from an epidemiology standpoint. So I volunteered to teach in the summer, which nobody wants to do, obviously, uh, for summer 2021, which gave me 15 months to try to plan this uh, incredible endeavor, which, uh, you know, 15 months was barely enough. There was a lot of things to do. So I'm going to go through all these individually. Uh, we had to figure out hardware. We had to figure out platform. You have to flip the classroom. You've got to figure out what you're going to do inside VR. And then there's, a, you know, some pretty compelling issues around students and privacy that you have to solve if you're going to try to run a study like this. And I'll talk about all of them individually. But first, uh, when I say we, these people put in 12 hour days for 15 months on this project, uh, probably more. They're just an incredible group of students and staff. And um, and I, I this was the 
biggest endeavor I've ever done research-wise in, in, in 25 years of being a professor or and postdoc. Um, uh, it, it's it, this is like nothing I've ever done before. It was a it was, it was a huge moment in my career. Uh, but these folks worked really hard, and when I worked, say worked hard, it wasn't just time, you know, just solving problems, problems, and we'll talk about them. Um, so hardware. You got to figure out if you're going to do something like this, you got to figure out, well, what what hardware am I going to use? And the obvious answer is the MetaQuest 2, the Oculus Quest 2, um, which cost $299 at the time, uh, caught, uh, now costs $399. The alternative uh, to the MetaQuest 2 is the Pico Neo 2. Uh, that cost $800. And why are they different prices? Because they're basically the exact same piece of hardware and they're buying the, the hardware from the same OEM. Um, you can actually do some simple subtraction and figure out how much your data is worth to Facebook because the same piece of hardware is being sold at a, it was a $500 loss. They just raised it up. So now it's a $400 loss. So they're collecting all the data about you, how you move your body. Uh, happy to talk more about that in the Q and A, uh, biometric data, uh, all sorts of things. And um, so we gave our students a choice and um, of which they use, and almost everybody chose the MetaQuest 2. Uh, Stanford bought 200 of these for me. Uh, there is a special academic grant during COVID for teaching innovation. And so Stanford actually footed the bill for this, which I'm incredibly grateful for. Um, but I will say, if you're gonna try this at home, um, we had one person whose job it was to get all these things provisioned properly to make their, sure that they're working, charged, cleaned, labeled, et cetera. And it was a much bigger job than I thought it was. So um, hardware is uh, a big deal. You have to choose a platform. So for those who haven't been in VR, when you move your hand, there's a hand controller. You look down and you see your avatar's arm moving, uh, not just the hand, but there's inverse kinematics that move your elbow and all of this stuff's got to work from a networking standpoint. And we spent a lot of time trying out all the different platforms. Uh, the ones we settled on was one called Engage. Engage um, is really good for teaching and learning. You can do all sorts of collaborative things, building 3D models, recording um, uh, the way that people are talking. Um, you can... Uh, it's really built around teaching and learning. Um, in addition, uh, the folks from Engage were kind enough to give us access to all the data. So we were running an experiment uh, while doing this and you have to be able to access that data. They gave us complete access. So uh, we're huge fans of the, of the folks over on Engage. But then you have to flip the classroom. For So I, I, I noticed um, a few names here um, I, I, on this amazing group of people who know this term quite well. For those of you who don't know what the flipping the classroom is, this notion of professors showing up, lecturing, students writing stuff down, and that's what happens when people get together face to face during a class. A lot of educational theorists think that's kind of silly and you can record the, the lecture that the professor doesn't really change that much year to year or you record one every year. And when you come together, you do stuff. It's collaborative, it's interactive, it's experiential. Um, the reason professors don't flip the classroom is twofold. Um, one is we, you know, change is hard and we're busy. Uh, the second is, there's not always an obvious answer to what you're going to do interactive in the classroom. And so the we the way that we flip the classroom here is we um, there's 10 week class and every week was its own topic. There'd be a topic on climate change. There'd be a topic on education. There'd be a week on ethics and privacy. There'd be a week on avatars. And and during that week on Sunday, they would read. We'd give them readings about the topic on Monday. We would meet, not in VR, we'd meet in Zoom because if you're just talking like we're doing now, VR doesn't add much value. So what we do on Monday is I would pick students and I would have them ask me questions about the readings. And so in this sense, as a group, we all, by the time Monday was over, we'd all gone very deep on this topic. We'd done the readings, they had to write a response paper on Sunday, and they also had to ask hard questions. So the whole group by Monday really knows this topic. On Wednesday, we would go on a VR journey. Um, so what's a VR journey? One VR journey we went on, so one week was the topic was medical VR. What you're looking here in the blue is the Reverend Jeremy Nickel uh, and Caitlin Krause. These are two experts in well-being and meditation. And we were sitting on these platforms and the Reverend Jeremy starts having us do paced breathing, okay? And while we're doing this, these platforms raise up and we're in outer space and we're looking down at the moon, uh, at the earth. Uh, and we're 
having the overview effect from outer space while the Reverend Jeremy is artfully taking us through pace breathing and weaving in what we're seeing and doing into the exercise. And um, it's the kind of thing that one of my jobs in creating this metaverse and the, the content in class was finding things were, that were great in VR. And this was one that I that just snuck up on me in the sense that it didn't, on paper, it doesn't sound very good, but there's something incredible about having the other people around to give you the social motivation to do something like pace breathing, but they're not staring at you. You don't see their faces. They're uh, avatars that have got this layer of, of, of not photo real. And, and there's something about it uh, that just really works. The, the students, uh, you know, this is an incredible example of a journey. And um, I, you know, one, one, you can tell I'm a, I'm a bit of a hyper person. I live in California and people have been telling me I should meditate for, for decades and I've never been able to pull it off myself. Uh, but something about this experience, actually, I was able to do it. And so that's an example of a journey. It's something we would do together. Uh, another example would be we would just go to a blank place and then 150 of us in the engaged platform, you can just hit a button and a building spawns and you can scale it up or you can drop a chicken and we would work together and we would build a city. Uh, we'd build a city that had a theme to it and at an hour and a half, 150 students working together to build something, you'd be blown away. You went, We go from zero to having worked together to construct a place. And it's just that, so that's the example of what the journeys would be on Wednesday. Now, going back to, uh, we've done our journeys, and now um, this is where things get interesting from an experiment-wise. Uh, class went on for 10 weeks. For eight of the weeks, we had discussion sections. In the discussion sections, we had, you know, small groups, about, you know, six to seven people, sometimes 10. And, you know, the problem with Zoom from a nonverbal standpoint is you've all probably seen this. When somebody looks left in the grid, it looks like they are looking at the person next to them. Obviously, they're not. They're looking off the screen. Now, when I do this, does that mean I'm signaling more attention to you? No, that doesn't mean that. It means I'm probably reading a little email that I got on an app that's separate. And so the problem with Zoom is that you're flooded with all these nonverbal cues, but none of them are diagnostic. But the brain still sees them, right? Um, what VR does really well is it puts people in a space and all the spatial aspects of communication are there. So uh, the person in the white sweater, um, everyone else can see that he's looking at the person in the gray sweater. Uh, the pink sweater person, when he, he leans forward, everyone perceives that personal space as happen, as as being mapped. And so um, the first time I brought the class together uh, for the first class, it was early June in, uh, in uh, 2021, there was people crying because they hadn't been physically together because of COVID in a large group, we had 60 people in a room. And for the first time, I mean, for those who haven't been in social VR, it feels like you're there. I mean, these cues, the personal space, the eye gaze, they're really compelling. And I've got 25 years of research showing physiologically, et cetera, that, that, that nonverbal cues in VR feel real. But we had these small groups. So back to the data. For eight weeks, small groups talking for 30 minutes a pop. So 30 minutes. And then we record the data at about 90 hertz. When I say the data, we're recording everything. We're recording the pitch on roll of their head, the X, Y, and Z of the head, the same for both hands. That's 18 degrees of freedom right there. Whether their mouth is open or closed, all the utterances that are said, anytime that they do any action with an engage, for example, drop a 3D model, uh, bring in a screen, everything gets recorded to a file. So it's an incredible data set. Now I, I wanna take a word on ethics and privacy. Um, when we get, wanted to get IRB approval for this, um, it wasn't enough to go through the IRB. The Stanford Legal wanted to get involved. And what we came up with was a process where pedagogically, everybody does the same thing because all the stuff we're doing is pedagogically interesting. Um, on the first day of class, we talk a lot about what we're doing in the study and students have the, uh, 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 the, the, the choice of opting in or opting out. If they opt out, none of their data are recorded I don't know that because I have a third party arbiter who's doing the, 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 the consent. And so a chunk of the class is not part of the study, a small chunk, actually. People are pretty excited about doing this, um, but everybody gets the same experience. And that's how we handle IRB. Um, and it, I can talk a lot about privacy if that's interesting. But what we have here, and I don't say this lightly, and I know there's a couple nonverbal scholars on this call, so I'm, I'm going to be careful with my language. We have the largest data set in the history of nonverbal behavior. 
Uh, and uh, I'm saying that I'm welcoming being proven wrong on that. And, and I'm saying that a bit hyperbolically, but I'm not sure it, it's wrong. It is 500 people, all of it longitudinally, you know, over 10 weeks. And, uh, you know, many of you may recognize this amazing figure from Alan Newell's uh, Unified Theory of Cognition. This is one of my favorite books as a graduate student. And, and this page just resonated with me. And when you think about people, there's four kind of time levels, biological at milliseconds, cognitive, you know, at around 10 seconds, or rational when you think about a half an hour task, which is what our discussion sections were, or social, which are, you know, another way to think about it is culture. I get to look at our groups. How do groups form? These people never knew each other. And we're getting to look at them at the millisecond level. And we get to look at them at the month level. And I've never had a data set like this. It's just incredibly exciting. And so um, one of the things we're starting on is nonverbal synchrony, which is, an, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the neatest things you can measure with groups, but it's really hard to do uh, for, for a number of reasons. And so what you're seeing here is just um, you, if you take two people and they're moving, you can slide time. So at time zero, there should be a correlation. And then the control condition, the pseudosynchrony is when you just slide that. So you want correlations in the middle and you don't want correlations on, on the edges. And uh, in general, we're seeing a lot of synchrony. Um, but now for those scholars that care about synchrony, which I do, you get to think about synchrony in so many incredible ways. First of all, the temporal component. Uh, how much data goes into synchrony? Do you just do a correlation over months? Do you do lots of little correlations over minutes? And all sorts of playing bottom up um, to go in there. But the, the more daunting task, and I say daunting in a wonderful way, you've got a group of people, almost all the work on synchronies with dyads. How you do the synchrony there is pretty simple. It's a correlation with two people. You have the temporal component you need to think about. But when you've got large groups, good synchrony doesn't always mean everybody is being synchronous, right? And there's not data on, you know, there's a handful of studies. And so just taking uh, groups of three, if you've got A and B and C, you know, is a high correlation with A and B, but C correlates with no one. Is that a pattern different when everyone's correlating? And so we're starting to just build these models of synchrony where you're really looking at, um, how the groups are uh, and, and, and how, you know, what are the different patterns among group members pairwise? It's really interesting data because there's just a ton of variance. Now, I should say part of the IRB approval here is outcome data. So after every discussion section, they fill out a questionnaire and they answer some things about VR. They answer some things about social interaction. It's called entitativity, how groupy is your group. They ask questions about, you know, their preference for spending time with others in their group. Uh, they do creative tasks where we can look at performance. Um, we can look at quantitative out, uh, data on tests that they take right afterwards. So what's missing from a lot of this large scale data is, you know, a label, uh, if you're doing machine learning, an output layer, and we have all that. So we're in the middle of, of, of building that. I'm doing a time check here about how many more minutes do I have? Five more minutes. Perfect, more perfect, more. perfect. So we spent two years transcribing. Uh, you can start with uh, software, things like Otter AI that can give you um, a best guess, but yeah, then you have to have humans go through. And so we now have 500,000 minutes of conversations in VR coded. And what you're seeing here is um, just a screenshot. This is a brilliant work by Cyan DeVoe uh, and by Dave Markowitz. Um, there's something called the meaning extraction method, which is, you know, it's a fancy way to say that you you do factor analysis on the frequency of words used. And what we're seeing now is that we're building a dictionary to help understand what's going in VR. And so, we, you know, the first factor there is about, you know, avatars and bodies. And the other one is about your senses. And then you can see there's a, a factor about talking about the class and learning. And so what we are doing is we're building these dictionaries. And now in addition to the verbal behavior, the nonverbal behavior, you get the verbal behavior. You can start to uh, understand how people are speaking and then what tells you about their mental states. Because in it, as I said, we've got all this data that they do after every one of these conversations. So we know how they're feeling. We know, you know, their affect. We you know their their arousal. We know, we know the valence. Um, it's a, an incredible set of data where we're answering all sorts of theoretical questions. My favorite question um, right now, and again, this changes. We have a pipeline of about thirty or forty papers that are going to come from this data set. About a third of them are uh, about four or five have been submitted, and about a third of them are, uh, you know, fairly far along. My favorite one that's going to come out in a couple of weeks uh, is. 
about context. So if you think about context, where you are, what the room looks like, should it be open space, closed space? How high should the ceilings be? There's never been great work on this because it's super expensive to build worlds, right? So you're either doing correlational work or you're running experiments with small samples of rooms and the rooms are typically confounded. There have been a handful of great studies where they put a, a false ceiling. What we implemented is something called a stimulus sampling technique. And, and my colleague, Byron Reeves, who's one of my mentors, likes to say that there's a lot more variance in media than there is in subject. So, so we, we make sure that we run lots of subjects, but we often don't make sure that we sample across media. So if you want to ask a question, how big should a room be to encourage well-being effects? You should not look at one room or two rooms. You should look at dozens of rooms. And in fact, we've looked at hundreds of rooms. Every discussion section was in a different room that was either very big or very small. And what we found in probably the most robust um, robust findings that I've ever seen in, in our lab, meaning just so consistent, is that very, very large spaces encourage higher nonverbal synchrony than small spaces. They encourage uh, better well-being. So there's a the way you're me we're measuring restorativeness. They're more restored. Uh, groups are better, better entitativity. Just about every group measure we have when you have these very huge spaces, I'm talking about hundreds of meters uh, in each direction uh, and to the point where you often can't even see any anything um, because sometimes it's infinite. But um, what we're finding is just huge effects of well-being, better group performance when you're in indoors and, um, and when you're in large spaces. And, and I like to show this image because this spot, this doesn't look like a great spot, right? It's just kind of a factory. But one thing no one's ever studied in the real world because it's incredibly expensive is just being in huge indoor spaces. And we've just found that huge indoor spaces are causing well-being in the same way other scholars have shown that being outdoors does. Very large indoor spaces are also um, causing awe. So uh, I, I love this notion of being able to finally study context in a very systematic way. It's super hard to do that uh, in the real world. So I will um, close on that. Uh, this is my book. Um, I'll send anyone a free PDF if you send me an email. A lot of the stuff I'm talking about is based in that type of work, and I will stop my screen share now. Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful talk. So much effort. Indeed, the, the database of, of nonverbal cues is just amazing. Um, maybe to I invite you, everyone, to ask uh, questions related to this talk before we open up. Maybe to, to continue my question uh, from Celia, is, is this um, what can you tell us about how the groups form and how how do maybe these nonverbal signals direct the formation of groups? How does this depend on the problem people are solving, on maybe some aspects of culture or individual? Do you have any anything to share here? Anything that you learn? Yeah, so we have a ton to share. Um, um, the one of the things that I've studied for a long time in VR is, is the trade-off between eye gaze and distance. So in the real world, when somebody gets close up to you, you'll look away, for example, in an elevator. Uh, and if you're staring, uh, you know, so the, the, in order to maintain a kind of a proper amount of intimacy, uh, we use gaze and distance to kind of trade off from one another. Um, and so what we can show here is learning of equilibrium, right? So you can see how groups uh, equal, I mean, again, the temporal component of this is just incredible. I mean, there's never, in VR in particular, as no one's looked over time, there's been three or four studies ever, and, and they've all been small sample and, 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 and both basically qualitative work that, you know, it's great work, but so you can look at how people learn to do things like uh, equilibrium, uh, trading that off. Um, we're uh, looking a lot at the difference between the groups where everybody's synchronous uh, compared to when synchrony is driven by a couple of nodal points. We're doing some network analysis on that. And then, um, you know, what um, What I haven't done, if, I'm not trying to be vague here. There's the bottom-up work that I can do with all the nonverbal data, and then there's pairing that nonverbal work with outcomes, you know, so I can look at the, the that discussion section's score on the test and I can look how the non, and we just haven't gotten to that part yet. So we've got a cue of what we're, which papers we're doing first. And so all the stuff I'm doing now is descriptive bottom up and all the hypothesis testing stuff is coming. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, 
if there are uh, currently no specific uh, questions for you, I would like to- I see one in the chat. Uh, why is open space so important? Um, <laughs> so Ugi, when she did this work, Ugi Han is a lead author on the context. She's amazing. And she, um, uh, she pre-registered our hypotheses on these, and, and there, there were hypotheses, and the, the, the two areas we draw theory from here, one is about awe, um, so in the architectural literature, there's, a, there's research on awe, which is um, uh, how to design things that are just going to make you feel incredible. Uh, that's, for example, wire chapels with very large ceilings, etc. Um, so there's that area. And then Ugi found a couple of really interesting papers, uh, you know, to, to uh, you know, dovetail with, with Celia's work um, on evolution, which is that large open spaces, you can see predators coming, uh, you can run away if you have to. And for those reasons, there's theories about why we like big open spaces. There's places to, the ways to get away. And so um, those are the theory predictions going in. Right now, I'm in the middle of teaching this class again, and we've actually put in mechanisms, um, ways to actually tease those two possibilities apart. So I'll have a better answer for you in about uh, three months. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to call on Linda, uh, who had a question for Celia. Maybe you could transfer her to the kind of more broader discussion. Um, you are muted. <laughs> uh, Linda, you are muted. Linda? Hello? <laughs> you should have an emoji for that. Uh, can you hear me now? Oh, now we can hear you. Okay, I've, I've just lost the visuals for... Um, the meeting. Um, I had a question for Celia, but I want to say first, these were tremendous talks. And in some sense, um, I wish they could get married. Uh, Celia is about cognition and development. And Jeremy's was about groups and bodies. And I would like to see those things coming together in theories about um, human cognition. Um, so Celia, I have a question for you. You have a, a short one and a longer one. The short one is, have you gotten a lot of people sending you photos of imitative behavior between children and adults that are similar to the ones that you used? Hi, Linda. Um, no, I, I, people haven't sent me photographs. Of course, I'm interested whenever I see any examples of adults imitating um, children. I'm also very interested in the research that suggests that adults act to mistake um, their imitation of children for the children's mm -hmm. imitation of them. Yes, and I think that that's a, a very important thing. And what that leads me into is a different question um, and a related question is that um, it's clear that the body is relevant to the development of cognitive gadgets. And, and I think that the cognitive gadgets is a brilliant idea. I love that. But um, I'm curious about how the body fits into an overall view of cognition. And then would, if we brought in the body to understanding more about cognition and you're bringing it in when you talk about evolution, not about evolution, about um, imitation, um, would that change our view of cognition as something that happens inside of individual heads or how would that affect it? How would you bring the body into the work that you're doing in a more expansive way? Well, um, I think our theory of imitation is pretty sensory motor. Um, uh, indeed, the, the most common complaint about it is that it is too sensory motor, that imitation must involve more symbolic processing than we claim that it does. But I have often been urged to take, as it were, an additional um, 
ontological, ideological step, as it were, from being an enthusiast for sensory motor processes to uh, a kind of a 4E approach, you know, embodied, extended. Uh, I'm never quite sure what the four E's are. Right. But I I mean, what what stops me from doing that? I guess a kind of a conservation tendency. I think that cognitive science may not be the most cumulative science around. If you compare it with something like physics, it's nothing mm-hmm. like as cumulative. But I think some useful things have been discovered that we can build on. And my worry is that if we play around yeah. with the boundaries and the ontology, uh, you know, what is a mind, what is a body, what is a brain, and so on, right. that we'll lose touch with the things that are worth conserving from the history of the discipline. That it kind of throws everything up in the air. It kind of provokes a scientific revolution when the data aren't calling for it necessarily. Um, so I think, you know, that's a kind of a personal explanation as to why mm-hmm. I don't take the extra step of becoming a 4E person. But I think I'm a huge enthusiast for sensory motor processing. Great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll email you and bring some other questions up. Lovely. Okay. Thank you, Linda. We have a, another question for Celia from Jeffrey. Uh, how quickly are gadgets occurring and spreading? And does that mean many of us walk around with big differences or deficits? And I'd like to broaden the question for both of you. Could you study this cultural evolution and how quickly they occur and spread in virtual environments? Is that one way to go? Um, shall I have a go first, Jeremy, or would you like to have a go first? You please, thank you. <laughs> um, the, the, the raw version of the question, as it were, it depends whether you will call any culturally evolved cognitive process a gadget. So arguably, the cognitive processes which enable somebody to play chess or to use an abacus um, are products of cultural evolution. Um, and you could describe them as minority gadgets, as it were. It's not you know, the majority of humans alive today who have some variant of the capacity to play chess. I mean, it's, it's a distinctive group. I focused on the cognitive capacities, which seem to be present in one form or another in most humans alive, um, because that was the explanatory target of classical evolutionary psychology. And I'm in the business of trying to revise classical evolutionary psychology. So if, if we take your question to include minority gadgets, I think probably they flash on and off um, at some speed. So it might be that, I don't know, um, somebody is taught how to play chess uh, in a very unusual context. I mean, it's partly a kind of a trial and error. It's partly through somebody who themselves developed an idiosyncratic way of thinking behind chess. And a few people might acquire that way of thinking, but it turns out across a range of games, not to be the best way of doing it. It it will be beaten by a more standard way of thinking behind chess. So probably, you know, at that level of minority gadgets, they might come and go quite fast. I was also thinking of Merta's question as to whether virtual reality could be used to sort of look at a speeded up formation of, you know, kind of look at the establishment of a new cognitive gadget in real time. But then I take it that at the moment, virtual reality is trying as far as possible to reproduce ordinary reality, rather than being used to put people in a kind of an immersive, unnatural environment, which you have reason to believe 
will lead them to develop a different way of thinking. But it, it looks like it has the potential to be used that way. Over to you, Jeremy. I um, So I love the question, I love the answer. I One of the things we're learning about VR as a medium is uh, Christine Nowak, I have to credit her with coming up with this great phrase, uh, you have to learn how to VR before you can learn in VR. And the medium is complicated. And so one of the, the first paper that we published off this data set was just looking at the effect of time. And what we found, we had two competing hypotheses. One is VR is this novel medium and it's people are gonna just get you know tired of it just because you know it's kind of cool and then you get sick of it because why do you need it? And the other is that, you know, it was gonna, over time they'd learn how to use the affordances, they'd find value. And we ended up finding the latter, which is all of our measures, whether, you know, how, how well they liked the group, how, how good their speaking was, et cetera, increased over time. So we definitely see temporal changes over time. Uh, I will say one of my favorite papers in our queue, uh, I have a qualitative scholar. The cool thing about VR, all this tracking data, I can now feed it back into the platform with enough fidelity that you put on the goggles and it's like, it's real time. In other words, the data are, take, are captured at 90 Hertz. So you can feed that in and it's as if it were happening. So you're doing time travel and you get to walk around a discussion section and just kind of walk around like a ghost. And I've got an ethnographer who's going through and the ethnographer is looking for cultural memes. One of them, for example, in Engage, uh, when you want to mute yourself, you take your wrist and then you, you rotate it and then you take your finger and then you take your finger and you press your wrist, okay? Because um, uh, that's how you mute and unmute yourself. And what you start to see is conversational turn-taking building around uh, the um, that gesture and you can start seeing the, these norms emerge. Uh, another one is, um, I love the Engage platform. One of the things that they're working on is uh, when you go to a new scene, all humans spawn in the same location. It's the weirdest thing in the world. You, you go to a new room and you're all sharing body space. It's incredibly uncomfortable. And you know how do, how do people handle that? And so we're looking as anthropologists going time traveling qualitatively through this work and, and just finding up. So, so there's room to do that work. And I, and I wanna think more about how that relates to, to, to your answer, Celia, but, but that work can be done. I wonder, can I just follow up a question on what you've just said, Jeremy, that um, this, this process of learning how to VR, um, in what ways do you think it's different from uh, prism adaptation, for example? I'm thinking back to those old experiments decades ago where people lived, as it were, you know, wearing prism, uh, inverting goggles, something like that. And they came to see the world as the right way up. Yeah. Would that be would that be a, the right kind of mental model to use to imagine what's happening in VR, or is your hunch that this is a much more radical learning challenge? I I, I love that example. You know, during my postdoc, one of my mentors was Jack Loomis, who was a visual uh, perception uh, scholar, and and we talked a lot about prisms and war prisms a lot. So uh, us and we in the VR community, we like prisms. Um, so I I, I think. I want to think more about what's different in, in general, but I, I I like you focusing on the perceptual aspect of it because I think it really it really is perceptual what's different, and then the the other thing is just your body's different, uh, and and you know, uh, one of the one of the in our qualitative findings we're finding in students so we don't do collision detection in VR. If you take your hand and another person takes their hand, it can actually go through it, right? And so our students are trying to do high fives. And they can't do a high five, and so uh, because their hands go through one another, right? Um, and so there's just lots of things that don't work, and it's kind of you know similar to the prism, like the world shouldn't be upside down, right? So it's I don't think it's that different in a sense. Great, thank you. It's related to to Winston's question. Winston, would you like to ask your question? There's one in the chat, but from Vincent. Um, what context do they like to spend time in? Um, I use to a particular context. Is that that contributes to the to the success of open spaces? Uh, given that we are maybe used to the smaller spaces right now. I um, so the we do have data on where they choose to go. 
Um, and those, um, I don't have that at the top of my head. I'll, I will, Vincent, I will, I, I will look for that. But um, is part, if part of your question is because of COVID, open spaces now are really, really special. Uh, I do agree. However, what, what, what the, the thing that strikes me the most is, you know, this is across the board on, you know, nine or 10 DVs. I mean, when Ugi did the pre-registration on this, I, I said, no, there's too many hypotheses. I, don't, I, I know I know you have them, but I, 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 you know, it's always risky to have a lot of hypotheses. And, you know, I, I think about half of them panned out, which is which is a lot given, given I think she, you know, consistently applied the same idea. Um, so it's a really robust effect. And, and for those of you that haven't, I, one of my, the worst, so for the follow-up study, we wanted to chase this down mechanism-wise. And so we measured a bunch of classrooms in Stanford uh, and we modeled the VR rooms to be the size of them. Uh, and they're so small. I mean, we the classrooms we stick, we stuff ourselves into, it's, you know, you do it for obvious reasons because space is expensive and there's a lot of people in the world, but you know, what, 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 one lesson learned for the metaverse is space is free. Don't, don't, don't cram us in boxes. Thank you. Uh, I mean, it kind of brings us this, this kind of spatial constraints to a question that I had for Celia before, but maybe you can discuss it both. And that is, what is the role of institutions in the emergence and development and possibility of development new of new cognitive gadgets or new preferences in virtual reality, if you wish? So in, in schools, we have curricula specifying how children should learn math for example, or how they should interact with each other, cultural norms about who should be the authority, who to learn from. Um, physical environments also constrain what kind of um, cognition we need or we should develop. And what is that? So it seems that, so in your work, Celia, you're talking about cultural evolution and, and transmission, basically, of, of, of uh, helpful variants through, through learning. And then what, yeah, so what is the role of this kind of built social environment, such as different institutions, norms, and so on, in speeding up, constraining uh, this development? <laughs> mm. um, I think maybe because I've focused so much on different varieties of social cognition, um, the relevant environment is other people, as it were. Did, you did say built environment, did you, Meta? Yeah, which could be virtually built in a way in our minds by norms yeah. that we perceive that by culture or architecture that Jeremy's currently looking at. Yeah. So it, it, it's not something I've given a lot of thought to because I've been focusing on various kinds of social cognition. Um, I mean, causal cognition, which is one that I'm flirting with the idea of getting into, seeing whether the evidence supports a kind of a, you know, wealth or poverty of the stimulus on causal cognition. There I would expect to find the built environment or perhaps more generally artifact to be very important, that the kinds of artifacts that you grow up with may well shape your conceptions of causality. Um, Maybe if it came to, you know, uh, mental mapping, cognitive mapping, the kinds of spaces in which you grow up could have a significant influence. So I think I'd be, I'd be, you know, my hunch would be it could have a huge impact, but it depends on the kind of cognition that you're in interested in. Okay. Jeremy. I, um, I, I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> I mean, it kind of brings me to the, maybe also more general question for both of you. And that is what, oh, let's see, two way maybe, for my, maybe more Jeremy, like, like what aspects of our current physical and social environments do you think are impeding our ability to, to adjust, to, to develop socially useful, useful social cognitive tools to deal with the problems we have today? Are there some architecture or other, maybe for Celia, more kind of social kind of institutions, you know, from the way our education system works to our culture, to how social media is structured that is impeding us right now uh, as, as human society to deal with, with our emerging problems that might maybe even lead us to some wrong paths. So, or in another way, 
if you could change something in, in human cognition, if you could introduce the new cognitive gadgets, you know, yeah, or if you could design stuff in Jeremy, what would that be to help our, you know, to, to help our, our intelligence really be augmented rather than detrimented by, by this new development? So, so I'll, be, I'll answer quickly and then and hand to Celia. A lot, of, a lot of our work does things that are impossible to do in the real world. So for example, I give you a third arm and how do you learn to control a third arm? Uh, you have to remap degrees of freedom from moving arms one and two uh, and come up with clever ways to have them power the third arm. Um, I do things with kids who've got chronic pain where uh, the way to treat CRPS is by moving your, let's say your knee uh, to, 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 to improve your leg. And what I'll do is I'll give them an avatar with a gain factor. So when they move 10 degrees, they see their leg move 20 degrees uh, and they get that kind of visualized success. And so a lot of the work that we do, I, I put a link to a, um, a link in the chat to, to a paper that we have on mimicry because that was uh, one of the great parts of Celia's talk was talking about imitation. In VR, mimicry is algorithmic and trivial. So my avatar and your avatar are always sending each other our movement data. I can grab your movement data, put my name on it, send it back to you, and you think that I'm, I'm and mimicry can be done at a delay algorithmically. It can be done at scale. So I can mimic 10 people simultaneously uh, because I'm sending each of them different versions of the tracking data as it goes out. And so the world gets really weird uh, when you break all these rules. Um, Celia, you just a, a quick question for Jeremy. So do you think? I mean, this is amazing, right? It completely expands the possibilities of human cognition for different solving different societal problems. Should like UN symposium on climate change be done in virtual reality where we have some other ways of communicating, expressing? Would that help us to solve problems better? On climate change, uh, that chapter four of my book is all about our work in climate change. Chris Didi's on the call. He's built incredible content for VR and climate change. Um, I think it's a great uh, tool. Um, if anybody wants to download for free, the Stanford Ocean Acidification Experience is a climate change module to experience what um, what, what, what it's going to be like when the oceans are, are destroyed. And uh, Chris's stuff will actually work on a computer. Rest for me, you need a, a headset. So, um, hey, Chris. That's wonderful. Can you please post some of these links? That would be great. Yeah. Celia, sorry. Before I have a go at Meta's fantastic question, um, can I just clarify on that? You mean there are, there's evidence that people are more likely to come to an agreement, that they're more likely to cooperate when they meet in virtual reality than when they meet on Zoom or in real life? That's huge. <laughs> I... The, the control conditions, when we were designing this study, uh, we pitched to the IRB, uh, Zoom is a control condition. And at the last second, it, it was gonna break my heart to throw away half of the VR data. And so I, I decided not to do the VR control condition, uh, the Zoom control condition. Um, and the, on the face-to-face -face control condition, uh, Ugi, we do have some data now on the face-to-face -face control condition. And we're looking at where VR fails compared to face-to-face. -to -face. But, um, you know, Zoom, yeah, I could talk a lot about that, but you know, VR adds some things that are great, but you know, what you can't do on, in VR right now is see someone's facial expressions and face is pretty important. <laughs> okay, okay. So so it's still the case that we're looking for VR um, to get close to the benchmark of face-to-face -face interaction. It, it It's not that it looks like it's ironing some problems out that it, are present it's, in face-to-face. -face. It's ironing problems out about body orientation, uh, attention signal through eye gaze, um, personal space, things like that. That adds to the group in many ways, but the not seeing the face is, uh, is you know, that problem will be solved in about a year or two, depending on who you, whose hype you listen to. Um, but but okay. it's still, for a lot of things, we still use Zoom. VR is not for everything. It's really not. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, it, I'll, I'll have a go at Meta's question, but I'm going to be thinking about it for weeks. I mean, <laughs> it's just that my first thought is metacognition, explicit metacognition. I would like improvement there. I think for two reasons. I mean, one is because I think I've mentioned in this forum before the evidence that people with weak metacognitive sensitivity, people whose um, 
their accuracy doesn't co vary very well with their confidence in their judgment. Um, you know, those people tend to be correlational data, the people who are at political and religious extremes. So I think there's good reason to believe that improving our metacognitive sensitivity would help with the polarization, which is so much of a problem in so many contexts in the world at the moment. Um, and I think it's one of the cognitive processes where there is um, kind of least appreciation of how learnable it is. Uh, it's treated as if, you know, either you've got it or you haven't. And I think it's often treated as if it's not something which is necessarily, you know, good to have. And, and that may be because we, we give people so much credit for confidence. So I think a, a gadget that both improved one's own metacognitive sensitivity and made one um, more aware that what you should want in a friend, in a collaborator, in any kind of decision-making group is people with good metacognitive sensitivity, not confident people. I think that would help us enormously. Fantastic answer, thank you very much. Thank you both, this was really exciting. I feel I could now go for early beers and talk for a few more hours at least. <laughs> Great, I hope we, we continue discussing this in some context. And now we are basically out of time. So I want to thank you again. Thank you the audience. And we'll see you next week with uh, talks by Cesar Hidalgo and Cindy Hnella-Silver on November 17th. Thank you all. Lovely. Bye -bye.